And I thought we could start by maybe conceptualizing the year or contextualizing our conversation within the year, as it's been a very bizarre year for political science. So as you've been doing research outside of the classroom in politics and foreign relations, what has this experience been like for you taking that research and bringing it into the classroom and also helping students navigate what's happening at the same time? Yeah, it's been a really strange year and we're not quite at a year from when lockdown started for I think most of us here in the States, but um, the coronavirus has been an international story for over a year. I think we're uh, coming up on the year anniversary of uh, you know, the brilliant, brave Chinese doctor who um, you know, died and was silenced about trying to warn the world about how big this was. And even before then, uh, this was already a really major story. Um, one of the things that I've tried to do um, when I was teaching last fall is to make sure that folks have a good sense of the logic that lies behind events like the outbreak, like the response to the outbreak, uh, how US domestic political events affect uh, how the United States approaches the rest of the world, how the rest of the world approaches the United States. And between the coronavirus, the election, and then the um, difficulties, including you know, an attempted coup after the election, um, we've had a really difficult time. And um, you know, I can't help but think that these are not really independent causes. Um, you know, as you have more unlikely events happen, the likelihood that you'll see other really unlikely events happen also increases because the foundations, the structures, the restraints that keep events within their normal guardrails really begin to erode. And you start to have the possibility for more and more unlikely and disastrous things to take place. And I think that that's actually kind of the story of where we are all together. And as I've been trying to understand how it is that US domestic politics affects US foreign policy, um, how America's role in the world affects the global structure and how changes in that global structure affect the United States, um, it's been a little tr troubling to be thinking about the fact that uh, you know, we have now gone through our first global crisis of the post-Cold War era in which the United States uh, on an international role basically played not only um, you know, a role that was not a leadership role, um, that it was just absent, um, but also the United States in a lot of ways was dramatically opposed for most of 2020 to any sort of international cooperation um, that would be uh, helpful in solving the crisis. And to give the Trump administration a little bit of the credit, uh, you know, things like the World Health Organization just did not function as they were supposed to. Um, but on the other hand, the Trump administration's response was tremendously unhelpful. And as we enter into a world in which um, the combination of human development and encroachment on wildlife preserves around the world, means that we're more and more likely to have the sorts of human or uh, animal to human transmission of diseases uh, that cause pandemics like this one, like MERS, um, like the original SARS, uh, as Zika and Ebola for that matter. Um, some people would say AIDS. We're actually likely to see quite a bit more risk of pandemics happening over the next 25, 30 years, um, even at a time when you know climatic crises uh, like we're seeing right now in Texas and as we've seen around the world over the last several years grow even more severe. Um, so you know, the challenge I think is to help people see the political logic of responses and why some responses are more cooperative or helpful or effective than others um, while also just trying to have people not overtaken by uh, the impending sense of gloom or oblivion that uh, you know is kind of understandable, but um, not really actually tremendously helpful in engaging with these sorts of issues. So as you're articulating, you this past year have been caught in the middle of a lot of different challenges when it comes to entering the classroom as a political science professor. You're both a researcher in your subjective work, your own views, and you're a teacher who's coming to a classroom with one of the most contentious issues American politics from this past year, how do you navigate 
when you bring in your views into the classroom, that dynamic, and where do you find yourself being a mentor to these students? I think one of the easiest ways to answer this is that there's a big difference between my own personal views about what we ought to be doing and my considered judgment as somebody who studies these issues about what is happening and what the possibilities are. Um, you know, you can be harshly critical uh, of an administration, a government, anybody in politics, um, based simply upon uh, your ability to analyze and judge and to see what's going on. But it doesn't really mean that you disapprove of them or you don't support them. Uh, and conversely, expressing support uh, for some part of the of an actor's agenda, um, or I should say, you know, appraising it in a relatively positive manner, doesn't mean that you support them. Um, this is really difficult. This is not uh, an easy line. It's something that a great many folks in the public and a great many um, folks among the studentry really have difficulty understanding. Um, but there's a lot of things that happen in the world where, you know, your personal evaluation of whether they're good or bad uh, is really secondary to your understanding about why they're taking place in the first place. Um, you know, there's, you can even have quite fundamental disagreements about how the world is ordered um, and still want to understand how this particular world order that we happen to live in takes place or why it operates in the way it does. Um, so that's one of the easiest ways to do it. And as I say, it's very difficult, especially when emotions are running high. Um, and as I've expressed elsewhere, uh, the fact is, is that the last four years of the Trump administration was something that was particularly difficult to distance yourself from. Um, the folks that his policies targeted um, were not abroad. They were not abstract. They were our coworkers. Um, our students, our friends, they were people in our classrooms at both the front and the back of the hall. Um, you know, it, it affected a great many people in a very direct way. Um, and I think that sometimes the best thing to do is just to recognize that uh, and to appreciate that and not to write it out of the story. Um, but also that means that when you are analyzing an administration or when you're analyzing a policy decision, simply recognizing that something is bad or undesirable or not what you would have chosen is not the end of the story. Um, because you also have questions about, well, what change to allow an administration to make these sorts of policy decisions? Have these policy decisions happened before? And what does that tell us about what their likely consequences will be? And uh, this, is, this can be you know, sometimes um, a little bit like an out-of-body experience because you end up talking a lot of times about issues that an ordinary person just wouldn't understand why they're uh, related. Um, but it turns out that to understand, say, the Trump administration's immigration policy, you really have to understand a particular Supreme Court decision from the 1880s or the 1890s um, about why a son of Chinese immigrants in the United States, Wong Kim Ark, uh, was actually an American citizen and why that matters for people who are facing deportation uh, or other discriminatory practices uh, during the Trump administration. So that's really the first part of this. You know, how do you operate in these times? And in a sense, it's like a crucible because it makes clear that your research, your thinking, your knowledge um, might help to illuminate some issues. Um, it also makes clear that your job, your responsibility as somebody who is uh, a scholar is to deeply understand and help other people understand those issues as well. Um, and fortunately, so far, we haven't ended up in this country as folks in, say, uh, Turkey or Cambodia in the 1970s or other regimes have, in which being a scholar makes you a target. Although, had Trump been reelected, I'm not sure that we were all that far off from a much more thoroughgoing uh, attack on universities than we saw in the first administration. Um, but, you know, you still have to consider what it is that your job is and what that means for how you approach these things. And sometimes that is recognizing things that the broader society doesn't want to talk about. And sometimes it's contextualizing issues in a way that might seem cold hearted, but is really all about making sure that you're thinking with your brain. Um, for mentorship, and that is a completely different relationship in a lot of ways. I mean, mentorship is all about making sure that 
people have the tools and the understanding and the advice and ultimately the resources to carry out what they want to do. Mentorship is not really about the person giving advice. It is about the person who's receiving the advice. Uh, and sometimes that advice is that, you know, what you want to do is just not feasible. So don't do that. Find another way to accomplish those goals. Sometimes it's about taking somebody who has very clear understandings of what they want to do and helping them to back out why they want to do that, what it is about this that uh, attracts them or appeals to them. Um, and then sometimes it's about putting different ideas in order or helping people to sequence them or using your experience and expertise to help folks understand what steps they can take in order to realize those. But that relationship um, is you know, much different from the vocation of being somebody who is uh, trying to understand the world and trying to make sure that you can explain the world. This is about helping somebody act in the world and the ethos of action. I mean, the praxis of action is very different from that of being, in a sense, removed from the world. Um, and so what you do there is, uh, I think that you have to be um, clear and open and honest and transparent about uh, what you believe and what you feel. You have to meet folks where they are. You have to make sure that you're um, engaging responsibly, but also recognizing that emotions are part of how we make sense of the world. Um, and also recognizing that sometimes that emotions can get in the way of being clear with ourselves about what our motivations are. So those are very different, right? They aim at very different modes of being in the world. And when folks are under stress and when systems are under stress, uh, it gets very difficult to keep those two modes going at full tilt. Um, and over the past 12 months, um, I think that we've seen folks balance those better than I think that most people would have expected. But it's also clearly been a drain on everybody involved, uh, whether they're students or faculty, uh, in trying to keep straight, you know, doing what the formal job description requires, and also trying to carry out those kinds of more you know, human, more um, personal relationships that undergird things like mentoring. Uh, so, you know, it's... Uh, it's tough. Um, and you know, the last thing I'll say about mentorship is that um, you, know, you can very easily misunderstand it on both sides. Um, you can misunderstand it because it's flattering to be asked to be a mentor, um, but sometimes you have to realize that you actually have no idea what you're talking about and that what you need to do is serve as a uh, kind of a, a sounding board for somebody else to work through. Um, and that you're just basically going to be there to sometimes offer advice, but mostly your role needs to be secondary. And sometimes people um, who are seeking mentorship, uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes it just doesn't work. Um, and sometimes it doesn't work because there's a personality clash or a goal clash or you know, something just comes up and you just can't light that fire that a really good relationship um, requires. Um, and you know, um, it's it's something that is really important. It's really great, uh, and you know, you only need one or two relationships like that as a time. It's nice to have more than that, um, but I think that sometimes people can collect mentors on their way to doing things and never actually do the thing. Um, but also, you know, if you've got one or two people in your corner, that's all Rocky had. That's all you really need. I want to respect your time, but I'd like to apply what you just said to the honors thesis, which I know you work on with a couple students every year. If you could talk about what that experience has been like, I know in my personal situation where you're my thesis advisor, you have encouraged me to do a thesis portfolio, a creative project. So I know there's a whole breadth of different projects that students have done with you. What has been most rewarding about that? What is that like on your end? There's kind of a phase transition that hits when people start working on a senior project or a senior thesis. And the phase transition is that, you know, for the first, uh, gosh, K through 12 plus three, so 15 or 16 years of your educational experience, if you're an American, uh, you are basically taught to regard school as a place where people tell you what to do, and then you do it, and then you get feedback on that thing. 
Uh, and then if you're doing an honors thesis or an honors project, all of a sudden, you have people who can coach you and who can work with you and who can assist you, but they don't know where you're going. They don't know what it is that you're going to produce. Um, they can't specify for you or model for you exactly what you're going to do. It is actually time for you to put all those skills together and frequently to learn new skills on the fly to create something that's original. And I think that that is incredibly rewarding uh, because, and this is going to sound very harsh, I don't think that the first 15 years are really education. I, I think that's, you know, mostly rote training. Um, I think that education really comes when we begin to have an opportunity to bring things out of ourselves, to bring things out of the world uh, and, and make them into something new. Um, and that is a different way of thinking about uh, the schooling relationship than the model where you know, some wise person has all this material in their brain and they're going to impart it into you or they're going to beat it into you um, or they're going to drill it into you. Um, you know, there's some things I think that you ought to have like that. I think that you ought to have your times tables memorized. If you are uh, working in you know, uh, journalism for a long time, not sure if it still uh, is that important, you had to have copy editing marks absolutely plain, right? Like nobody actually writes like that in the real world, but you just had to have those memorized. All these little tricks of the trade. Um, and those are just things that you need to know. Past that, past those really foundational skills, learning how to accomplish something does not mean mindlessly repeating the steps that an instructor has applied in order to get to some predetermined result. Real education, real ability to demonstrate that you have learned something in a profound way requires a person working on a hard problem, applying tools that are familiar to them or that they can make familiar to them in order to create something new. And that doesn't necessarily have to be like a symphony and it doesn't have to be a 90 page thesis involving experiments in political science, although like both of those are totally valid. In ordinary lives, people have to creatively apply their knowledge, their learning to new situations all the time. It, it's really the last thing that is keeping all of our jobs from being automated. I mean, think about this. If every problem in the world were just something that you could solve with a pre-written algorithm, if this happens, do this, if this other thing happens, do this, well, that is something that computers are infinitely better at doing than we are. So the essence of working and being a, a productive human, of being somebody who is in the workplace, in the world, able to come up with really interesting solutions to projects, or even just to apply steps that they pretty well know to situations that are pretty well, but almost, but not quite perfectly like the models they've learned. That's really what matters. Um, and that is, as I say, a phase transition in the way that people approach it. And a senior thesis or project is a great way to do that. And ideally, it should be something that accumulates based on what the student is interested in, in some way. It should not be something that people walk in in September and they're just absolutely cold and they're going to try to cram everything into you know, those nine months. And that happens, it can work. But ideally, this is something that you have worked on over time with an advisor, with a uh, you know, lab, uh, with somebody in classes, uh, or even something that you've been working on on your own. All of those are ways of getting to that precise feeling of integration, of really putting together all of these different skills that you've acquired in order to make something that is your own. Um, and so, you know, I think that senior projects and senior theses are really important in that way. If you're undertaking a traditional senior thesis, you are finally getting to learn what it is your professors actually do. And this is not gonna be a masterpiece, right? Like this is almost explicitly a journeyman piece of work. 
in which you show that you have by the end mastered the basic elements of a trade. Uh, but I think that being a journeyman is nothing to be ashamed of. It's actually quite an accomplishment. And going through the process of learning what it takes to do even basic work in an applied or an academic discipline, that's really difficult. And it gives you an appreciation for what it is to do any sort of project that is self-directed and open-ended and the kinds of compromises, but also the kinds of breakthroughs that that requires. Uh, senior projects, I think, are really underutilized. And they are the dominant way of doing things in a handful of departments, but I think that they're really underutilized because this is where you get to do anything that isn't a traditional thesis, anything that isn't you know, 50 pages of uh, academic research. And I think that a lot more folks uh, should be considering projects because a lot more folks have interest in doing that kind of big, important demonstration of what they've learned and what their skills are, but not necessarily doing it in an academic format. And, and so, for instance, working with you uh, on, uh, on, on your magazine, I mean, it's, it, publications, even a little bit hard to define it, right? But I think this is something where you've learned a tremendous amount about how to um, apply uh, the skills that you've learned about how to operate in a multicultural environment, about how to work as a writer and editor, developing skills as a manager and somebody who facilitates intercultural uh, work, and even uh, picking up a number of technical skills along the way. You know, those are skills that are not necessarily the same ones that you know, the person who is doing an academic thesis is going to develop, but they're pretty obviously important skills and they don't necessarily fit neatly within any of the predefined courses that you can take at UMass. And this is the other great drawback of the first 15 years of your education, which is that if nobody's teaching a class that covers that skill, and if the only thing you're doing is going to class, you're just not going to learn that skill. But the second you are hired in any workplace, it could be Goldman Sachs, um, it could be working at Burger King, it could be anything in between, you are going to have to start learning something that wasn't in the curriculum and some way to apply that. And the more interesting and creative your job is, the likelier you're going to be doing that all the time and trying to incorporate and rewire your own skills uh, as you come across new information. And that is really the hallmark, I think, of having a successful and interesting career. So you know, senior projects and senior theses, they are tremendously interesting because they allow you to finally put together all the things that you have learned and then learn what it is that you've been developing all of these years. And I, I think that they are tremendously important. And I think that they are you know, not just capstones, but in a sense, foundational. Um, and they should be the sorts of things where you look back after having completed them uh, at those previous 10 or 15 years of schooling and you have a good idea of what it is that you were building through all that time. Well, thank you so much, Professor, for your time and your consideration in answering my questions. I wanna be respectful of your time as well. Um, so I really appreciate this conversation. Thank you. Yeah, this is great. Thank you.